Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Scottish Parliament's think tank, um, Scotland's Futures Forum. I'm Bruce Adamson. I'm the Children and Young People's Commissioner, Scotland, and I've also had the privilege of being the chair of the European Network of Ombudspersons for Children this year. And this afternoon's panel is on Can Education Build a Sustainable Society, um, held in partnership with, with my office. And we are delighted that so many of you have been able to join us on this Friday evening, and we have an incredible panel of speakers. Um, but your involvement is really important as well, so join in online. Um, we want to see your questions and your comments in the chat. You're very much part of the discussion along with our expert speakers. And again, two very important people who are joining us are our two BSL interpreters, Heather and Bruce. They'll be helping us all make sure that we can communicate effectively. So thank you so much to them in advance. Um, so how important is quality education for children and, and adults in helping us make informed choices on the environmental impact of our actions and choices? Um, how effective is education that's currently available? And what we, can we learn from other nations and other places? This panel aims to address some of these questions and all of yours in the next 60 minutes, so it's going to be an exciting session. Um, get involved in the chat. When you do, um, if you could put in um, where you are, um, whether that's in Scotland or somewhere else, and also stating your name as well, so we get a good sense of, of, of where you're joining us from. And I'm exceptionally excited to be introducing you to our four amazing panelists. Um, we have Emily Farquhar, who is an operational volunteer for 2050 Climate Group. And she also acts as the 2016 volunteer COP, as the COP26, need to get that right, uh, volunteer ambassador for Edinburgh and the Lothians. So you're very welcome, Emily. We also have Liam Fowley, MSYP, who is the current Vice Chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, Liam was elected as an MSYP for Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley in March 2019. And we have Professor Dave Ray, who is Chair of Carbon Management and Education at the University of Edinburgh. He's also the director of the Edinburgh Climate Change Institute and a policy director at Climate Exchange. But you're very welcome as well, Professor Ray. Um, and the final member of our panel is Professor Pete Higgins, who is a professor of outdoor environmental and sustainability education at the University of Edinburgh and director of learning for Sustainability Scotland. It is great to, to see you all. Um, we've got this great panel. We've got all of you. Um, if you want to join in um, online on Twitter, the, the hashtag for the whole Festival of Politics is um, hashtag FOP2021. So you can join in there. Um, within this session, as I say, go onto the chat, um, give us your name and, and, and where you are, and any comments or questions, very welcome. So. Education and sustainability are closely linked in human rights terms. I've got the best job in the world as Children's Commissioner because it's my job to promote and safeguard the rights of children and young people across Scotland. And in terms of human rights to education, the purpose of education is to develop all children and young people to their fullest potential. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child specifically goes into the fact that the development of respect for the natural environment is a specific requirement on the state in terms of education. And we've seen young human rights defenders and young environmental defenders really leading the way in terms of our understanding of what needs to change in terms of sustainability. And so this link between education and sustainability is something that's really important in human rights terms. And so I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists to summarize reasonably quickly um, some opening remarks on what is the role of education in building a sustainable society and what does that look like? 
And um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll come to you, Emily, first, and then we'll, we'll go through in, in the order that I, that I introduced you is probably a good way to start. So, so Emily, I'll pass to you. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, for me, the main purpose of education is to provide people with the knowledge, the skills, the values, and the morals they need to integrate into and contribute positively to society. So if you translate that into the context of um, building sustainable societies and, and think about how we do that, the role education can play is to equip learners with the knowledge, the skills, the values and the morals they need to uphold sustainable um, and socially just patterns of living throughout their lives. Um, what that looks like for me in practice is schools and, and other education institutions across the board adopting a learning for sustainability approach um, to their teaching, which incorporates global citizenship, outdoor learning and um, sustainable development education as well, ultimately with the aim of, of producing well-rounded people who sort of understand and appreciate their, their environment, their culture and their heritage, and who also have quite a strong connection to nature as well. Um, I think if we can achieve this across the whole of Scotland and, and ideally across you know, the whole world, uh, the result will be a population who, who understand the significance of their choices now and in the future um, as well, which will yeah, vastly reduce the risk of irreversible anthropological climate change and, and various social injustices as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That, that was a, a really kind of well, well-rounded introduction to, to set off our, our discussion. I'll, I'll pass now to you, Liam. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, really important would be the, my automatic response there. Um, we've, we've obviously spoken with a lot of young people. It's all about our organisation here to represent young people. I, and overwhelmingly, young people say that it's individuals that have the responsibility when it comes to tackling climate change, but they need to be supported in doing so. Uh, we can't just all be climate experts because it is a very complex subject, and young people themselves will, will admit that the complex. I'll admit that the, the complexities of climate change are, are vast. So, being supported into knowing how to tackle climate change uh, is, is a really important one. The Learning for Sustainability Action Plan has obviously been published and things like that, and that's a really important element there. But it's about addressing the needs of young people there as well, because the, the learning that an adult may have to do, who's gone through most of their life, is going to be vastly different to that of someone who's in secondary school. Uh, in schools themselves, there needs to be more of a, a well-rounded approach. All subject areas should have a responsibility there to, to discuss sustainability and climate change, because they're all interlinked, no matter what classroom you go into. So it is a really important element, and ultimately, young people need to be supported in, in learning how to live sustainable. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Liam. And, and again, coming through strongly already, this idea that, that everything's interlinked and, and shouldn't be kind of pigeonholed. And so uh, passing now to you, Professor Rain. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, and all the best things have, have been said already. Poor old Pete's got to come after, after me, but uh, I haven't got a huge amount to add to what um, has already been said, other than Admitting my own bias as, as someone who loves teaching and as an educator, you know, it's fundamental in terms of a sustainable future for our planet, not just the people on it, but our natural ecosystems as well. Education is at the heart of all the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, if we look at the challenges that we face throughout human history, we've got through them well where we've had good information and, and good education, and we've really faltered where we haven't had that. And the pandemic is an ongoing example of of successes and failures. I think what it looks like for me is you've talked to, we've talked about integrating things. It's really that systems thinking. And this is at every every level um, in terms of uh, the education, you know, the life lifelong education. It's being able to understand the links between what you do and the implications of that, how every Everything we do in our lives has a um, is linked to what everyone else is doing and to those natural ecosystems. And so that systems thinking, I think, is, is at the heart of it for me in terms of realising that sustainability uh, through education. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I think, again, that link to the wider the sustainable development goals, the wider human rights framework is, is really important as, as well. And so 
Um, and education is often described as a human rights multiplier, which I think is really important that, that education is sitting right at the heart of all of this. And yeah, the, 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 the tough job now, Professor Higgins, is to come, to come last in a, in a panel of four. I do promise I'll switch the order around as we go, so you, you won't always be following, but I know you'll have some, some great things to say anyway. I, I don't mind at all. I could just say what they said and, and finish there. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I will say a few things. Um, there's a quote I'm, I'm very fond of, and it, and it goes a bit like this. The role of education is to form the citizen. The citizen is a person who, if needs be, can refound civilization. Now, that may seem a bit uh, overdramatic, though some would argue that the current twin climate and biodiversity crisis suggests we are actually at this point. Um, and I pretty much believe that we are. We really have got a few years to, to, to deal with the issues we face today. But however, even if we're not, the idea of the ultimate purpose of education being to help civilization move forward, respectful of current and future generations and of global biodiversity, upon which we utterly depend, um, seems to me to be entirely logical and moral and actually a beautiful thought. Um, and as for the focus of education, you know, uh, Emily said it really, she used the, the core capacities that, that we, we've talked about in the development of learning for sustainability as a concept for Scottish schools. And I've really nothing much more to add other than the, the idea that we, we think of ourselves as um, respectful of the natural world rather than just users um, or even conservers uh, or managers. We, we need to develop that notion of respect um, with regard to the natural world as well as with all others on this planet. Thanks, Bruce. Brilliant. Brilliant, thank, th thank you. And I think I think everyone watching will, will agree that's a fantastic starting point for, for us all to, to build on. And so let's move into some some questions now. There's, there's a, a few that, that I've got here and I can see people in the chat are already starting to, to engage as well. And so my, my first question would be around the quality of education. So how important is quality education for children and young people, helping us all make informed choices about our own impact but also perhaps reflecting on how we engage with systemic issues and engaging with engaging with governments as well. And so how important is the quality of education there? Um, Emily, do you want to go do you want to go first again? Yeah, of course, no problem. Um, I think all of all the investments needed to support sustainable development, few are more important than ensuring everybody gets a quality education. Um, I think quality education. So an education that prioritises teaching equality, um, skills development, building emotional intelligence, uh, provides adequate infrastructure for learning and um, learning equipment, as well as prioritising knowledge sharing, of course, is um, really important because I really do believe that a person can't make a proper choice without the proper information and the proper perspective. Um, so making sure that we provide everybody, both adults and children, and you know all sorts of learners, with a, a quality education is vital to ensuring people are able to make informed decisions on the impacts of their actions. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thanks, Emily. Liam, Liam, I know you've been doing a lot, particularly over over kind of the COVID period on on education. Did, do you have any thoughts around the importance of the quality um, of education? Uh, yeah, we've got loads. Um, there's, it's really important, I think, ultimately. Uh, and I think what's important to recognise is young people don't just learn in a classroom in a school. There's other forms of, of learning there, informal curriculum, for example, and youth work all play a really important part uh, in supporting a young person's development and learning experience, especially when it comes to sustainability. Uh, if, if we get young people outside more, uh, it's much better than uh, being in a classroom and learning about it. But I think ultimately it is, it's super important and making sure young people have a say in that education as well. They're, they're co-designing that curriculum uh, and they know what they're going to be learning about and, and what they are. they've got an active say in how they're learning as well. I think are all really important parts because young people very much have to be on this journey and obviously young people are very much at the forefront of this as well. Uh, young people have to be brought along as uh, with us on this journey, not be told what to do uh, when it comes to this. Because, as Emily so rightly said, that you, you can't make informed action if, if you don't have that learning base uh, beneath you. Yeah, I think that, that's a hugely important point. And again, that point about participation and making sure that, that children and young people of all ages are actually actively involved in, 
in designing and um, and being part of, of how their education is delivered inside and outside the, the classroom. And so, um, a oh, good opportunity to come to you to you, Dave, here in terms of in terms of what's the importance of the quality of education? What what makes quality education? Yeah, so all the things have been talked about, but one of the key things is investment and support in teachers, and that is something which is is obviously fundamental. You would think it would be a given, um, but actually, in terms of where we need to get to in terms of sustainability and climate education, that just won't come out of the ether. Actually, that means you know um, putting the time into teacher training, into making sure they've got the time and the resources. One of the things, so I mainly work on climate change. One of the things there is there's loads of resources out there on climate change, but the quality question is a really good one because actually not all of those resources might be as high quality as others. And as an educator, you know, having help in terms of that quality assessment, what's useful, making sure it fits with what you've got to actually deliver in the classroom, that's a vital part of where, where we're starting to get to, but we need to, I think, do better on that so that when you're in front of a, a class, whether it's out on a field trip or, or in, a, in a physical class or online, you know, you're, you feel confident to be able to deliver that education in a high quality way. Absolutely. And I think I think that's that really important part about supporting the system and where the support needs to be and the duty on the state to, to provide that. And and Pete, could I bring you in here on that on that question around the importance of quality, but also maybe get any of your reflections on the quality and effectiveness of what's currently available in Scotland? Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I think that the notion of quality always um, tickles me, really, because uh, it, with regard to education, what, why would you want anything else? Um, of course, education has to be of quality. It has to be of high quality. Um, we wouldn't want to offer anything else. And yet there, there, there is a lot of patchiness out there, really. And, and when I think of this concept, I, I feel the need to locate it in the context in which young people are growing up and the, the world we, we face now. It's a world of increasing complexity. But the issues we face are interdisciplinary, involve social and scientific dimensions. So quality education has to address this complexity, interdisciplinary, excuse me, interdisciplinarity, and the systemic approach that Dave mentioned earlier, the systems thinking approach. Um, I, I work quite a lot with teachers, uh, both pre-service and in-service, and, and whenever I, I talk to groups of teachers, I say to them at the end, you know, remember you are the most important people in the world. Really, they are because. You know, you might think that, you know, healthcare professionals or others are, are, are the most important people. They are if you if you need health care. But of course, where did they get their initial education? They got it through a school system. And that is why school systems across the nation have to be equitable. They have to make sure that we can allow all people who need education into them without any form of prejudice or um, or, or privilege, really. So um, I, I hope that's that's answered enough of your question for now, Bruce, before um, I start rattling on about all sorts of other things. I think we could, we could, all, we could all listen to you all night, so please don't, don't apologise about, about rattling on. But um, I, I wonder whether the panellists have got any reflections on maybe what Scotland's doing well in terms of, um, in terms of education and, and what maybe could we learn from other countries? And is, and is there any examples that anyone's got about things that maybe other countries are doing that we could learn from? Or things that Scotland's doing really well that, that perhaps we should be exporting to, to other places as well. So that that comparative um, value, given that this is a a global challenge that, that we're facing, and the the real value of learning from others. Who wants to come and I can I can the wonders of technology allows me to see you all, even though we're not in the same place. So so if anyone wants to kind of just just throw a hand up, otherwise I'll I'll um, I'll pick you. I don't know, Dave, did you want to come in there or? And then Pete, I see you there. Yeah. So I mean it. I think there's a, there's a lot of good practice around for, through the, the climate change lens um, specifically. I mean, we've had for the UK, the net zero strategy came out this week, which is a massive document, which I don't think anyone's read apart from the people who wrote it. Um, but in there, if you go to kind of page 200 and something, there's a commitment there for the UK to bring forward a strategy that aligns um, children's services, education at all levels with the net zero transition. And that was good to see. We've already had those conversations in Scotland as well. And, and um, I'd argue we're, we're ahead of the curve in terms of knowing where 
those gaps are like we talked about in terms of support for teachers, uh, the resources, etc. Looking overseas, one of the ones that I, I look at, at with Envy is France. They have an office for climate education there, which is um, uh, one of the UNESCO centres. Um, and since 2005, they've had their environmental education kind of mandate across their education system. And you kind of, you can see the benefit of that in conversations kind of, you know, some of those who studied in 2005 are now, you know, teaching or, you know, or, or working in universities. Um, and just the, the kind of the understanding of the issues we're facing on sustainability and climate re really has been mainstreamed. Um, so there are exemplars. They would say they're not getting it perfect, and that's that's definitely true. Um, but I think they can learn from us in some respects in terms of how we've, particularly led by people like Pete, how sustainability has become, you know, something which which has to be delivered um, effectively within our education system. It'd be great if that happened actually down south as well. Um, but I think we're we're at that stage where everyone knows we need to do this and do it better, um, but no one's doing it perfectly yet. Okay, so it's a good answer, very nice and diplomatic as well. Which, um, and so I'll, I'll come, come to you, Pete, but also I'm going I'm to add into the question something that's come in from the chat, which I'm starting to, to see now from, from Bob Hill in Montrose, who, who's asked about how we add this into an already crowded curriculum. So, so is there an issue that, that um, something would have to come out of the curriculum in order for us to, to add this in? Um, and and how, does the, how, does it, how does it all fit together, Pete? Right. Well, I think the first thing to say is that um, this is not my estimation, but um, it, Scotland is widely regarded as uh, a world leader in learning for sustainability. And, and actually, uh, when Emily made her first statement, some of the words she was using referred very closely to the, the, the terminology used in learning for sustainability. This was a, an initiative of the Scottish Government that's, that started in 2011. Um, and we have now uh, learning for sustainability as an entitlement of all learners and a professional requirement of all teachers. Now, this is remarkable. It doesn't really exist anywhere else. So all credit to the Scottish Government for um, initiating that and, and allowing us to work on it to develop this. It's also linked very closely with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, now, that, that isn't to say others haven't been doing uh, really good work out there. And it isn't to say that everything's perfect here. Uh, the current situation is quite patchy, some outstanding practice out there and, and other places where people don't really seem to see it as a priority. So there's, there's elements of this that I think we can really improve. In terms of other nations, I would say, you know, Finland is, is of course a world leader in education. And even though that's the case, it recently uh, revised its whole education system to place sustainability at its core. Uh, closer to home, Wales, of course, has made a great commitment with its Future Generations Act. Um, and there are other countries in a recent OECD review, like um, Canada and Singapore, that did very well in terms of global competency. So there's a, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And we in Scotland are actually quite, um, we're quite thoughtful in our approach to uh, how we argue that we've got a, a good approach here. But there are things that are quite unique. For example, both Liam and Emily referred to the importance of outdoor learning as part of our concept of learning for sustainability. And that engagement with the natural world is actually pretty much unique um, and very powerful. The research evidence is clear. Um, in terms of that really um, uh, lovely question that uh, is, <laughs> is very, very difficult to answer. The curriculum is crowded, but um, what, what I think we need to think much more clearly about is going back to the capacities of learners to deal with complex interdisciplinary issues, particularly through the systems thinking approach and how then the subject disciplines become the servants of the core questions. And there has to be some part of the education system that allows that to happen. And that's precisely what Finland's done with its, um, with its approach to the curriculum. It said, yeah, we're going to teach subjects, but actually we're going to teach these partially, at least through um, this kind of systems thinking approach. They call it phenomenal learning in, uh, or phenomenon learning in Finland. Now, we have the opportunity to do this at the moment because the SQA is being reviewed, revised, and who knows what's going to come of that. If I may say one other thing, Dave and I both work in, in a university, and universities are culpable here in requiring 
students to provide um, uh, high level grades in specific subject areas. We need to think much more carefully about the quality of thinking of the students we bring into our universities rather than worry just about the grades. I hope that helps, Bruce. Thank you. It, 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 it does, and again, it resonates very strongly in terms of in terms of a rights-based approach. Liam, Liam, did you want to come in and, and comment on on any of that in terms of what you think might be going well? Some of the, the examples that we've heard from from Pete and Dave of some of the international comparators as well. Yeah, I think there's a whole lot going on, and I think in many areas in Scotland, there's some very good examples um, of of how it's going well. But I mean, that brings in the issue that it's not consistent. But I think individually, it's going well. Um, if I take it back to even training teachers. Uh, I'm a student teacher, and throughout a lot of my learning, there's been discussion on how to integrate learning uh, for sustainability, things like that, and climate change. Uh, just you know, mentioning it now and then, they're relating it back on certain subject matters, but also how to start thinking about, uh, uh, as Pete was saying, uh, an interdisciplinary approach, but also a whole school approach, getting young people involved and making their own decisions in the school and how can the school start acting more sustainably, making young people again, as I said before, bringing young people on the journey with uh, the, the adults and the teachers and things like that to, to get them thinking about how we are making sustainable choices uh, in the school as well. And you've got things like Park and Stride that are starting to come in as well. And that's about you know walking to school and things like that. And it's not just about walking to school. We're going to learn about why we have to walk to school, what's it doing, how we're helping and things like that. Uh, and I think there's loads of good examples across the whole of Scotland with that. I think what we now have to start working on is, is joining the dots and making it more uh, joined up and, and consistent across across the country. So all young people are getting a, a very similar uh, learning experience when it comes to, especially when it comes to climate change. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Liam. That, that's really useful again, as well as your perspective in terms of um, being a trainee teacher as well, but but also the the views of, of Young people across Scotland through the Youth Parliament. Um, Emily, did you did you want to come in on on this point? Yeah, of course. I think because I'm not working directly in education, um, I'm not a teacher. Uh, I think my impressions of the quality and effectiveness of the education currently in Scotland won't be as uh, maybe up to date as the other panelists. Um, but I do feel I might be able to sort of provide a bit of an insight on, on, on my opinion because I graduated from secondary school in 2016, so five years ago. Um, and my experience of that going through uh, primary and secondary school, I don't remember getting a lot of formal um, sustainable development education particularly. Um, there was not very many discussions about uh, anything to do with sustainability um, at all. However, what I do remember is a lot of um, outdoor education. That was quite a strong part of my learning, and I'm not sure if that was just uh, my schools or if you know it has been mentioned that you know Scotland does have quite a, a good focus on outdoor education, and it's possible that that was what contributed to that. But I do feel um, that was instrumental in developing my personal connection with nature. Um, and I think that's a, a testament to the effectiveness of outdoor education in, in promoting sustainable behaviours and also the importance of prioritising outdoor education. So, um, you know, just to take this opportunity to say that I would urge all educators to, to take that into account when developing their curriculum and, and really continue to build that into the curriculum in Scotland, because I think it's, I think it's really, really important. Absolutely, and I think we all very strongly agree with you there, Emily. And again, it comes through um, very strongly from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child when it talks about education, um, that important role about outdoor education and about that understanding and respect for the natural environment. Um, we're also seeing a, a lot of good um, good comments and questions coming through on the chat, so, so thanks all for that. And I'm going to weave a couple of those in now, and I'll come back to some of the other questions later. So if you've put in a question and I haven't asked it yet, we will, we will come, come back to those. But um, I was particularly interested in some of the stuff that, that you were saying um, earlier, Pete, and others were saying around learning for sustainability and how it infuses the whole of Scottish society, building our, capac our capacity to contribute the sustainability at the local, national, and the global level. And, and that's being reflected in some of the comments in the chat. And so Julie Marshall, who's, who's an heir, said that um, she thinks that there's a strong link between education, sustainability, 
and creating a good society that, that crosses lots of boundaries from social justice, inequality, and rights-based approaches. Um, and uh, Mark Langdon added in um, uh, some, some critical thought around saying, is there, is there a risk that, that we're focusing too much on the answers to climate justice lying in individual actions? And he suggests that might be misinformed when actually our focus should be on systemic um, and broader issues and points to, to capitalism and colonialism being significant drivers um, of the issues that, that we're facing at, at the moment. Um, and also linked back to, to a question from Julie, uh, Marshall, who focused back on, on teachers and the thought that how do we support teachers um, and more broadly, in fact, she's saying, so the first teachers that children have are their parents, families and communities. This, it takes a village to, to raise a child. And so um, outside of the formal education system as well. So there's a lot coming in, which I think links very strongly with, with, with what you've all been saying. But um, perhaps, Pete, I'll, I'll, I'll throw back to you there then, because I, I think this links very strongly with what you were talking about in terms of the plan that we've got in Scotland for learning for sustainability. Um, and bringing all of those different aspects together. So I'll, I'll pass back to you, Pete. Sorry, that's a bit of a rambling um, uh, collection of ideas, but but hope, hopefully you'll you'll take some inspiration from it. I'll, I'll try. And there, there 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 are a number of concepts in there that I, I, I'd like to to refer to, but uh, and try not to take too long about it. I mean, I, I think the first thing is to say that um, Scotland's got a really long tradition going right back for basically the past 100 years um, in terms of trying to build sustainability into education. And, and that's grown over the, the, the last 20 years in particular, uh, to the point that we are just now. And, you know, it's a big thing to do to try to build uh, sustainability in at that level and at that scale. And so we're, we're all doing what we can, but it, we're, we're on that journey now. How, how's it going? Well, I, I think that, that process has been going quite well, but one of the things that's really helped has been the Scottish Government's commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, the First Minister signed up to the minute they were published, and then to build these into the National Performance Framework. So in terms of what we're hoping for our society to become, all you need to do is look at the picture of the National Performance Framework and you see all the same colours as the SDGs. But actually, that needs action in each of these and in particular, it needs these to be inter integrated together through policy. Um, and it's very easy to say, oh, well, this is the job of education, without realising it's also the job of health, it's also the job of environment, it's also the job of agriculture, forestries, fisheries and food. So we need to be sure that our national policies are joined up. And if we do so, I think we'll get multiple benefits that will infuse the whole of society. Um, in terms of the, the 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 issue of the individual having too much weight on their shoulders, I feel that very strongly. It's a point that Mark made, and in, in, um, you you referred to there, Bruce. It, it's one thing for educators to help us help people to understand that our actions can can have a significant consequence for other parts of the world as well as here at some time in the future. It is another thing entirely to uh, encourage people to think that means I need to know how to vote. That means I need to know what what politicians are saying. That means I need to be able to interrogate their answers, their questions, um, interrogate their views and question them. Um, and to be a really thinking, critically analyzing individual who is is suspicious really uh, of, of the arguments that people put forward until you're convinced. So it's that restlessness that I want to see in, in all of us, whenever we see a, a politician promoting promoting one thing or another, or indeed, you know, um, we, we, we're exposed to fake news or whatever it might be, it's that critical thinking that will allow us to get there. And I want to see Scottish government policy built around those sorts of values within the uh, national performance framework and, it, and its policy um, infrastructure, really. So it was a rambling set of questions and a rambling set of answers. I'm sorry, Bruce. No, please don't apologise. I think I think I think it was that was beautifully answered, and I, and I think particularly the link to um, the fact that Scotland was one of the first places to sign up to the SDGs, and then took the further step of of embedding within the national performance framework. And we've also seen more recent commitments to the incorporation of of rights, and so we've already got legislation. Um, 
which is needing amendments on the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, which has been interpreted to, to bring in a lot of concepts around um, respect for the natural environment and sustainability. But also we've got further commitments from Scottish Government to specifically incorporate um, rights around the natural environment as part of a, a, a new piece of legislation um, we would hope to see next year. And, and so some of these legal processes as well, um, turning some of that rhetoric into, into policy and actions, hugely important. Um, um, who else wants to, to come in on that? You can pick any one of those those those, those points that, that we came to. But um, Emily, did you want to did you want to come in at this stage? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Mark Langdon's comment about um, you know people thinking that the answers to climate justice lie in individual actions and that being wrong. Um, I also, in the same way as Pete, uh, right, that resonates with me a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of focus on, um, you know, pressure for um, action to be taken from the bottom up, uh, and we're, you know, we're always told that we need to sort of recycle more and turn the lights off more and travel less and things, and and those are all very true. And um, I'm not saying I don't agree with that because I do, um, but I think we do also need to be teaching um, people, you know, in at all levels of education that there is a big issue with. Um, the way climate action needs to be taken from the, the top down as well. Um, you know, we need to put much more of a focus on that, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say to Mark that I, I do agree with, with your comment and we, we do need to focus more on that in, in education. Brilliant. I, I, I strongly agree as well. Dave, did you, did you want to come in at this stage? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, just, just like Emily says, it, it's kind of, and Pete said it as well, if we're thinking of it through the education lens, it is having that understanding of the system. It's that system's thinking. So, you know, you can, if you've got, I would count that as poor quality education, if you end up thinking the only way we can tackle climate change is individual action, you know, in terms of recycling, that would be bad climate education because that puts a lot of pressure on you as an individual, but it's also not fact-based because, you know, recycling uh, is not going to stop climate change. So it is getting that understanding, that awareness of some of the issues in the system, and there are big issues, um, and that's part of that high quality education. It's understanding is top down and bottom up, and actually it's not working like it should at the moment, in terms, certainly in terms of addressing the climate crisis. Um, and you only get that by a good systems understanding. Uh, so it comes back to that high quality education question. Thanks, 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 Dave. And Liam, did you want to comment on on this point? Yeah, I think uh, I would maybe a point of clarification as well. Um, when I stated that uh, individuals being responsible, uh, that was based off of research when we consulted young people aged 14 to 25, uh, and that was a piece of work mainly focused on the reduction of pollution levels. Uh, and one of the questions we asked was, who has the responsibility for reducing waste and pollution levels? Uh, and young people ranked individuals as being the most responsible. However, they also ranked um, local authorities, the governments, uh, and manufacturers being responsible as well. So just a little bit of uh, reassurance and uh, just re redefining that. Um, more widely, uh, from a climate justice perspective, we know that global climate emergency is obviously an issue of climate justice, and um, where those who contribute least to greenhouse gas emissions are, are, are most impacted. And young people told us through those consultations that countries most responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions must be their first to reduce their emissions uh, as well. So, point of clarification. Uh, on the uh, kind of more wider thing about education, again, um, I think, I mean, there's not much more I'm going to add to what the other three excellent members have said, um, but I think the most important one that I'll always reiterate is, is about that co-design approach with young people, empowering young people to, to you know, go down their own route on, on learning and designing the curriculum with them, and be that through the formal curriculum or more informal curriculum or the youth work and outdoor education, things like that. Um, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be a pile if I didn't do a plug on. I think uh, we have to protect the right to youth work uh, and making sure youth work budget cuts are not um, are not well, youth work budgets are not cut any more than they should be because youth work does play probably one of the most important roles in not only developing young people but letting them learn and, and develop in terms of climate change education. 
I strongly, strongly support that point, Liam, and in, in, in that investing in, in youth work and investing in outdoor education are fantastic multipliers of human rights. That we, we, we know from all of the evidence that they're really good places to, to invest money in terms of making sure that we can build up um, really good quality, supported, relationship-based work that, that, that can go on to, to ensure that we have fantastic results. And, and maybe I'll, I'll stick with you, Liam, and, and just picking up on a question a, again from Mark Landon and, and adding in um, a little bit of my own. Um, he's commented on the, the risk, perhaps, that we're focusing too much on a curriculum which is about developing a workforce for industry at the expense of critical thinking and emotional or political literacy and, and, and well-being. And that, that links to a, a question of, of my own around the role of, of children and young people as human rights defenders. And um, I wrote to the directors of education just last month um, in the context of protest, um, recognizing that the, the UN's recognized that acting as a human rights defender and, and protest has a really high educational value. Um, and I'd be really interested in, in views on how kind of protest and education mix together and how outdoor education, things outside of the classroom, how important are they um, in terms of the, the balance with, within class learning as well? And how much of this needs to focus on things like critical thinking, which I know many of you have, have spoken about and kind of emotional and political literacy, well-being, understanding of, of the environment. Um, so, so Liam, I'll maybe stick, stick with you on, on this point, whether you've got any views around, around that. Oh. We're going to be started in education, Bruce. We'll be here all night, uh, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I think, uh, well, especially when you mention, yes, is my response actually in general. I think, in terms of the curriculum, we maybe focus too much on curriculum and assessment at times, and we need to start moving to more of an approach of uh, allowing young people the opportunities and empowering them the opportunities to kind of not learn themselves, but to, to find out their own opportunities and things like that, and allowing schools to be there to merely guide them to get through that themselves. Uh, so yeah, I think I agree with Mark on that point. When you when you reference especially the protests and things like that, those are really important things to young people because these young people aren't just going to protest to get out of school. They clearly are, you know, really passionate about this issue. They're really their hearts in it, and and if they feel that impelled that they have to go out in the streets, they're clearly quite up about it and want to show their support for it. That is nothing that a school should not be saying, and that it is not your place to do that because it absolutely is. Uh, it should be a school's place to say, "Yeah, get out there and do it," because that's what it's all about. Show, show for what you believe in, and things like that as well. I think I, I feel like I'm banging the same drum here, but if we get young people involved in designing their own curriculum again, that empowers young people to think uh, it's not just about learning to pass an exam. We're here to genuinely learn. How to reach those again? Those four capacities that we've spoken about. How, how do we reach those? And, and those young people uh, will tell you exactly how they think they want to go about doing that. And then with a lot of bit of guidance from uh, teachers, they'll uh, get get to that. No, no bother at all. So I think um, there's a lot we can do in the curriculum, and I'm not going to keep going because I will be here all night. Uh, and I think it probably starts with let's get young people meaningfully participating in that, uh, co-designing the curriculum with them, and making them feel like decisions are made with them and not just for them. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thanks, Liam. And, and, and Wendy Pring in the, in the chat has, um, is agreeing with you strongly there and, and pointing to the opportunity that we've got with, with the redesign of, of education systems and SQA. But that's only going to work if we take an, a different approach rather than this um, focusing on, on the current metrics around, around passing exams. And so some strong agreement with you um, in the chat there. Um, Emily, did you did you want to comment on on this point? Because you've you've mentioned already a bit around ed, outdoor education, and and I know with with your role at, at COP26 and um and the, the work that you're doing, that, that this is something that you're quite passionate about as well. Yeah, so I think it's really important. I agree with everything that Liam said. Um, I think it's really really important that we have uh, as much opportunity as possible for children to um, engage, like I said earlier, in outdoor education, but also in protests and things like that. Anything that uh, brings them out of the classroom and engaging with the real world. Um, I, I feel, I believe strongly in, in um, the values and the benefit, the value and the benefits to um, connecting with nature. You know, doing things like the Duke of Edinburgh Award was very beneficial for me. Um, engaging in any sort of you know beach cleans and bushcraft and all that sort of thing um, is so useful. I think it's very um, clear, always has been clear, that academic teaching and academic assessments not for everybody. 
Um, but there's so much more to education, and um, if we focus too strongly in schools on um, getting people to sit exams and you know that very traditional style of teaching, it, it doesn't work, and you're not helping everybody to realise their full potential. So yeah, I think we need to get people uh, engaged in learning in loads of different ways until they have the opportunity themselves, as a child or as a young person, to to find the way of learning that the method of learning that suits them. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Emily. And again, again, this this human rights based approach to education, I think, comes through through so strongly in all of that. Um, Dave, did you want did you want to comment on this point? Yeah. So I, I mean, I've been looking at the the chat as well, and it's it's such a we could go on all night, like you say, on this. Although it is Friday, um, but yeah, one of the points about um, this potential dichotomy between what we we want we need to see in terms of that systems thinking and uh, sustainability being embedded in terms of education, that being high quality and a dichotomy between that and this narrative of providing the workforce for a new industrial revolution. You know, I think there's there is a danger there that actually. That, that new industrial revolution, the net zero or green industrial revolution, that can't happen without our education actually being a rounded one, which gives that critical thinking um, kind of education, that systems thinking for um, our school leavers, for our graduates. That will actually undermine um, what industry needs. So, so that that point needs to come through. through. I suppose we've talked quite a lot about educating our students, we've talked about training our teachers. There's there's an education job to do with policymakers still. You know, so we talked a little bit about the the patchiness of policy around the world, um, and that's and there's patchiness within our countries as well in terms of um, at a local level. So you know that is an area where I guess we also have an important role to to build their capacity to understand the importance of this. I'm going to not name the government, but on, this is related to Sapphire's question about um, COP26 and some of the schools being shut, and, and that you know that would, wouldn't that be ironic if that meant the schools can engage with climate change because they're not in school. But um, in discussions about green recovery with, with one government, we we're talking about climate change and sustainability and what a what a crucial part that needs to play in terms of um, uh, coming back after COVID. Which hopefully we will, and the pushback was that um, because children had missed so much education, we didn't have time to talk about sustainability or climate change. That would have to wait until I don't know five years, ten years, whenever the pandemic's over. And that kind of understanding, um, we need to somehow address that. I know you know um, those conversations are hard to have sometimes. You know, speaking truth to power, and actually. Our students, just like Liam was saying, probably they're doing it much better than we are. But we need to keep the pressure on there too, because you know they're they're, they're kind of they're a key enabler for this to happen, not just in a piecemeal way, but actually in a comprehensive and consistent way. Thanks, Dave. And and that's so consistent with what I'm hearing as as children's commissioner. One of the things that that many of the children and young people I've spoken to um, are really angry about is that that the global pandemic that we've been faced with has drawn so much attention away from the very pressing issues of the climate crisis that we're in and all of the broader discussion we're having around sustainability, which was a key human rights concern prior to the pandemic um, and dropped off the radar um, in, in a big way because of the focus on, on public health and, and children and young people who have already been leading the way as, as young human rights defenders on this are quite rightly really concerned um, and wanting to bring back that, that attention. And I think that, that that's something that's come through really consistently from, from many of, of the young climate activists and young human rights defenders I've spoken to. Um, Pete, do you, do you want to, to come in on this? I realise, and also um, Dave, uh, thanks for picking up um, directly from the questions as well. I, I realise I'm probably failing in my role as chair and we're having a bit of a, a broad ranging discussion rather than a, than a QA, and a but, but um, I'd encourage the other panellists, if, if you want to as well, to, to pick out anything from, from the chat in your answers, otherwise I'll, I'll try and, and do it. But um, thanks for that and I'll, I'll pass to you, Pete. Can I first say uh, Dave's point about educating policymakers? I, I, I think some policymakers are, are quite keen to be educated, others not. Again, that's where truth to power really matters. You really do need to tell them. They need to know about this stuff. But there's another community that I think we really need to work very much harder at, and that is the, the world of the media. 
and and they really do need education. Some of them, some of the media misinforms. And there, there's one academic who talks about the collapse of the information ecosystem, which to me really resonates with the way things are going with the media. And we do need um, all, all of us involved here and people who think like us to think about how we might work with these communities. That's a bit of an aside, uh, though a, a hugely important one can, in relation to what I'd like to say about young people and their uh, the protests and, and and what goes with it, really. I think the first thing for me is, is to ask the question, when does a young person become a citizen? Um, we're fortunate in Scotland that we have got a vote uh, for young people at the age of 16. To me, that's really grown up. All countries should be doing that. But does that mean young people are not citizens before they're 16? Well, actually, uh, I, I hear a lot more mature thinking from 14 and 15 year olds than sometimes I do from people my own age. So I think we need to be quite careful about uh, being respectful of the ages at which young people develop and, and their voice in society. Um, educating in the real world is, is profoundly important because we teach indoors because it's convenient. I, I often um, ask education policymakers, and, you know, it, it, when they say, why do you want kids to, edu to, to learn outdoors? I say to them, well, can you explain to me why they're indoors? And essentially what it comes down to is it's convenient. Well, what, what kind of basis is that for education? The subjects themselves that's, that we all learn are beautiful. You know, I, I, I get all dewy eyed about about cosmology or, you know, or, or bits of biochemistry or whatever it might be, uh, the art, prose, poetry, music. But actually, the, the systems are beautiful, too. And we need to make sure we educate around those. And and, and I think finally, the, the idea of protest as being an educational endeavor. You know, maybe that's where the classroom is now. The, the classroom is the protests. The classroom is wherever the young people are, not just when they're in, in school, um, th to, to think about what they can learn from wherever they are and whomever they are with. That, for me, is, is the, the, the mark of, of truly engaging young people in recognizing the beauty of being a, a lifelong learner, which is what we have to aspire to. Thanks, Pete. And again, that, that, that's, picked, that's picked up so well, I think, on some of the things that are coming through in, in the comments. Um, Kirsten Leesk was, was, talk, was talking about this kind of education as a lifelong process and how we, we engage with people. And that link to the media that, that you added in there, I think, is really important. Um, and uh, a, a lot around how we can make sure that, that learning happens everywhere. Um, in, terms of, in terms of children and young people being uh, citizens or, or rights holders um, from a rights perspective, that, that's from birth. And in fact, very young children are already able to, to engage in really active way in lots of these discussions Some fantastic work by the children's parliament and, and, and primary schools all across the countries and in, and in nurseries across the country, these discussions are happening. And so I think there's a, a lot that we can, can learn there. The, the democratic deficit is an interesting thing in terms of that children in Scotland Young people in Scotland don't have don't have the vote until 16, and then not on 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 all issues. And the South African Constitutional Court has um, has ruled on this point, saying that those young people who don't have the the right to vote on things actually have additional protections for their right to protest um, because of that democratic deficit and that real importance of seeing that that children at any age need to be involved in in the way in which we make decisions. And if they can't access a participative decision-making process, which often they can't, and there's an obligation on decision-makers to do much more of that, then, then protest is a very natural form and, and actually is, is a very important part of, of their education. Um, we're getting towards the end of, um, of the session now, but I'd like to, to, to come back to kind of one point on maybe kind of where we are and where we're going. And, and so I'd like your reflections on, do we think that the school population now is, is more educated on building a sustainable society than perhaps their, their parents or, or grandparents were because it's built into the curriculum? And what do we think it'll look like in the future in terms of tangible differences that we might observe in the generations to come because we've got an education system which is committed to um, global citizenship and sustainability? And so how far have we come so far and, 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 and where are we headed? Um, who wants to, to kick this one off? Um, Emily, shall I, come, shall I come to you? Yeah, I think uh, the answer is, for me, in short, is yes, I think people are much more, in general, much more engaged with sustainability now than they were, say, you know, my parents' generation. Um, 
you know, I think my myself and my friends are thinking and talking more about um, climate change and climate justice and social justice um, a lot more, I, I think, than I hear from my parents that they were at my age. Um, so I think we've been largely successful so far in, in integrating that sort of education, uh, both in schools and also to pick up on, on Kirsten's point, also that education is a lifelong process. And I think actually beyond school, we've got a lot of people engaging in discussions about all of these sustainable development topics um, a lot more now than maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. So yes, I think we're, we're, we're very successful. I think in terms of where we're headed, I hope that it's, we're going to continue on that trajectory. Um, it's very important that we do. Um, we are facing a twin crisis of, of, of climate and biodiversity, um, the climate and biodiversity crisis on, on both levels. And it's really important that we teach that to everybody in schools, but also everybody who is potentially older and maybe missed that education in schools also needs to be engaged in a positive way with, with these discussions. So. Yeah, we need to just keep talking, keep the conversation going, and, and trying to reach everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, 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 Emily. Liam, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think, as you expect, broadly agree with Emily. I think certainly more aware of the climate crisis. I think, as with all age groups, there are sectors of, of us that are all very switched on and, and climate aware. And then there's the kind of middle ground that know about it, and then there's those that are trying to just not take an interest in it. And I think that's replicated at, at all ages. And someone put a comment in, in the event chat thing I just picked up about kind of lifelong learning and how education is not just the you know the, the first few years of your life. And I think that's a really important part. How do we reach out? And again, it's in the same lines as what Emily was saying, is is reaching out to not only young people but all ages to to make them more climate aware. I think on the question, yeah, I think we do. Um, Young people do have a sound grasp of it. Uh, our campaign that focused on climate change uh, was one of the most engaged with campaigns that we've ever run, uh, and that probably just signifies how kind of aware young people are about it. But as I've said, we can't just you know we're, we're very much just putting the, the I was going to say put the gas on, but that seems like a terrible pun. And um, we're kind of very much running running towards and, and trying to get everyone more engaged, and I think that's a really important um, part of it. But yeah, pretty, pretty much the same as Emily, to be honest. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thanks, Liam. And, and Dave? Yeah, so, so my uh, favourite recent example was the Climate Assembly. If you haven't looked at their report, then look at it. But that was um, 100 people drawn from right across Scotland um, who didn't have any kind of specific knowledge of climate change. We involved the Children's Parliament as well. They they tended to, to know a lot more. But by the end of that process, wow. I mean, they were amazing in terms of the, the level of awareness across the 100 Assembly members already in terms of our first sessions. But by the end of it, um, their recommendations went way beyond, I think, what any of us as kind of evidence, um, giving supporting evidence was expecting. And I think that model is one which somehow we need to replicate across the whole of Scotland because that gave an opportunity for that lifelong engagement with the the evidence and, and, and that ability to reflect on what needs done through those contexts and that expertise of, of, of people from across Scotland in, in different you know, communities and different sectors. Um, and that's that's going to be a kind of a hard job because we can't do a climate assembly for everyone in Scotland at that level, um, you know, just through in terms of centrally. But actually, that kind of model, having that across all the regions of the Scotland, I know on commu some communities are already doing it themselves, and actually supporting that. That's how we can we can essentially deliver that that quality education, that quality understanding, high quality understanding, that systems thinking. Um, in a way which isn't just about, you know, we, we should get it right in schools, absolutely, but a lifelong point is so important. And I think the assembly around, particularly around the climate crisis, that approach could be um, really powerful. Certainly, um, it was a great process to be part of this past year. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. And and Pete. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to be an optimist uh, with regard to where we are just now and where we might be. Um, certainly in Scotland, I think we've we've got the basis of uh, a lot of good stuff going on. As Dave said, it's the um, it's expanding that to a, a grander scale, which is really important. How do we do that? 
and I think one of the one of the ways that I th think about this is is in terms of what I would do for my friends uh, and my family. You know, if I think about the world that I live in as being something that I have that intimate connection with, then I'm prepared to do a lot for it. And I and I'm not um, meaning uh, at a fairly superficial level. I think understanding is one thing, but then the actions that we take, not just in terms of the, the, the small daily issues that we've been talking about, but those those issues to do with representation, voting, all that kind of stuff, I think is really important. And I think we're at a good point to do that. I think um, the structures we have within within Scotland assist in that process, really. Um, I think the other thing that, that is really important here is to recognise that there are benefits. We haven't talked quite enough about the, the positive benefits of doing these things. Uh, not just for ourselves and for future generations and for uh, the world's biodiversity and its future, but actually in the here and now, the health and well-being benefits of spending time in nature, working with other people in a community of interest, and actually acting. You know, and and there's one person in this screen here that you you can tell I work very closely with, Dave Ray. Kirsten's another person I work closely with. Amongst others, I do stuff for ideas and I do stuff for people. And the collection of those two things together brings brings me to a point that I'm willing and able to commit, and I see the benefits of doing so. And I think we we just need to to work much harder at at, at growing the capacity across communities to do that. I think that that combination of kind of optimism and inspiration and 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 needing to do to do more is, is, is a great way to end because we are un unfortunately out of time. Um, so what well, a fantastic discussion it's been, and I know these discussions will continue in other places as well. So thank you so much for all of you who have been engaging online. Thanks so much for all the, the active questioning. Um, but I'd like to. Um, if we're in person, I'd be asking everyone to, to join me in, in, in thanking all of our panelists. So please do that from your lounges or wherever you are. Um, please please do show your appreciation to our amazing panelists. Thanks to the, the Scottish Futures Forum, the Scottish Parliament for, for working with, with me in my office and putting this together, um, and, and particularly our, our panel. So um, Emily, Liam, Dave, and, and Pete, you've, you've been absolutely incredible. And I know you will have um, really inspired a lot of people to, to engage more with this issue and, and have um, more discussions. And in particular, thanks to, to Bruce and Heather, our BSL interpreters. Um, we really appreciate that support in, in, in making this much more accessible. And, and so, so thank you for your, your um, hard work this evening. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that that later on today we've we've got um, more discussion as part of the Festival of Politics. Um, the session on Scotland's marine life and the health of our seas is starting right now, um, entitled "Should We Stop Eating Fish?" And then over the weekend you can join a number of free online events, um, discussions on just transition, uh, fast fashion, diversity in politics and a fantastic conversation with Professor Suzanne Simard, who's a world-renowned scientist whose revolutionary work on the subterranean world of trees is the subject of our Hollywood film. And so please uh, get onto the website, enjoy um, engaging with those, and um, please th join me in once again thanking Pete, Dave, Liam, and Emily for their fantastic contributions today. Um, please continue engaging with this conversation and have a good evening and have a good weekend all.